My name is Peter and I'm honored to be your host today along with my co-host Mohamed Shahid or as he prefers, just Mo. Uniminds Festival is organized by Knowledge and Technology Transfer Offices of University of Maribor and University of Ljubljana. In association with our uh, industry partners and uh, supporters from the innovation community. The main partner of the event is Novartis in Slovenia. And this festival would not be possible without the support of the Republic of Slovenia and the European Union under the European Regional Development Fund. In this parallel session, we will give a snapshot of competences, innovative projects and good collaborative practices in the field of drug discovery. Each speaker will have a three minute long presentation followed by three, minute, three minutes for questions and comments. And after all presentations, we will encourage you to have an open dialogue as well. We are especially interested in how to join forces in the future development trends. But before giving the floor to Mo, I would just like to present some basic rules. I will be a timekeeper, so whenever you see me after this introduction, it means uh, the end is near. If not already, also I would ask you to rename yourself in a way we know what to call you. Throughout the event, we encourage attendees to keep cameras on so you can see each other. We encourage you also to post and ask questions and make comments. Uh, during the presentation, please use Zoom chat box. After the presentations, you, will, uh, you can raise your hands and uh, you will be allowed to speak directly. Let me introduce also Mr. Mo. Mo Shahid is highly experienced drug discovery consultant with a long and proven track record of success in pharmaceutical R&D innovation. And with that in mind, I'm giving the floor to Mo, who will be moderating this session. Mo, the floor is yours. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, be involved in the session. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and for the opportunity to be involved in this, what looks like a very interesting scientific session. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Well, yeah, so as you might have heard uh, that we had a fabulous day in terms of drug discovery yesterday with the news of the advance and a very promising a treatment that may be coming for the treatment of COVID-19 and the, the global challenge that we are facing in terms of the pandemic that's going on. So perhaps I think today, you know, we're all excited with this new development and perhaps we can transfer some of that excitement and energy into our session today. So as Peter mentioned, uh, what we have in the agenda is a short pitch like presentations. And uh, so the, the schedule is tight. So without further ado, I think we should get going. So the first presentation is by Urban Cossack. So I should say apologize in advance if I don't get the pronunciation correct. So please do bear with me. But Orban Kozak is going to be talking about a new drug for treating canine cognitive dysfunction. Thank you. So let's get started. 50% uh, of dogs over the age of 11 show signs of canine cognitive dysfunction. They get frequently lost in familiar places, have changed sleeping patterns, lose their appetite, and have accidents inside the house. A big reason for these symptoms is a severe decrease of levels of a neurotransmitter in the brain called acetylcholine. And we can increase its concentration by inhibiting its enzymatic breakdown. But the problem is that existing acetylcholine esterase inhibitors also produce adverse effects like vomiting, nausea, and, and diarrhea. So it's a much better I, I, idea to use selective butylcholine esterase inhibitors because they don't produce these adverse effects. So we have developed a new selective butyrylcholine esterase inhibitor with a very attractive name called GUK1402. It isn't effective only in a test tube, but also in living animals. 
it crosses the blood brain barrier and gets into the brain where it selectively inhibits butyrylcholine esterase and increases the levels of acetylcholine. It improves the memory and learning abilities of mice with impaired memory and learning abilities just as effective as acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, but it doesn't produce their adverse effects. We have already tested our patented compound on real patients. We have made an oral drug with our compound and performed an experimental treatment trial with dogs suffering from canine cognitive dysfunction. We were very happy when dog owners reported that their dogs were doing a lot better. No more <clears throat> getting lost in familiar places, improved, uh, increased ap appetite, um, and, and no more accidents inside the house. So it's safe to say that we have developed a new drug for treating canine cognitive dysfunction. Thank you. Okay, whilst um, the audience is uh, kind of mulling over the, the information and thinking about the presentation for perhaps comment and question, maybe, maybe I can start, uh, Urban. So are there any potential drawbacks? I'm sure you will have thought of this, of this particular approach for treating and neurodegenerative uh, condition that you mentioned in, in these animals, you know, uh, I guess it's the uh, canine form of uh, human Alzheimer's, right? Yes, uh, I mean, the major drawback is that it's not a cure. I mean, it's, it's, it's just to, it, it's just to alleviate the, uh, the symptoms. So but, but so far as the best we can we can do is to, is to just um, improve the quality of life of these dogs. So, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the solution, but it's a start. It's something, something different than the existing treatment. Right. So I think that's, that's kind of the, the biggest drawback, even, even, when, even, even, the, even the pharmaceutical companies that I talk to have said this, right. that, they're, that they're more interested in a cure than another treatment of symptoms. Yeah, so it's not likely to have a disease modifying effect, I think you're yeah. saying. Uh, but I was actually just wondering about the molecular target itself, butyl cholinesterase. Uh, as I understand it, that's a non selective cholinesterase, right? So it'll, um, it, it'll, it won't be just acetylcholine metabolism that will be affected, but perhaps other uh, cholines as well. So is that, will that pose any issues in terms of this approach? I don't know, maybe, um, because uh, butylcholine esterase also met, uh, metabolizes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, even, even some drugs like, um, like um, aspirin also, but I, we're, we're, not, we're not at that stage right now with, when we are thinking about potential in, interactions with other drugs. But yeah, it's always a possibility. It's always a possibility. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there questions in the from the audience, uh, Peter? I see a couple of. I just encourage the participants again to to post questions, but uh, no replies at the moment. Okay. All right. I if if there is no questions, I suggest to go to the next. I think we move on. Yes, please. Presentation. Yeah. So okay. the. Next speaker is Jan Kukos. So we move from neurodegeneration to oncology and his presentation is entitled Proteolytic Enzymes as Targets for Development of New, new Anti-Tumor Drugs. Hello everybody and thank you to organizers for the invitation. It's known for a long time that peptidases are key drivers uh, of the cancer progression and that by impairing this harmful peptidase activity, we can improve the treatment of the, of the disease. And due to this, many different approaches have been applied while using either the endogenous protein inhibitors 
or neutralizing monoclonal antibodies or in the last time gene editing and so on. But uh, the success uh, was, I have to say, not great. And only few of these approaches uh, reached clinical trials or the clinical application. There are several reasons for this. Uh, one is low bioavailability of big molecules. Then it's a low specificity, toxicity, or the combination. And to overcome these problems, we developed so-called the peptidase inhibitors platform uh, to generate uh, low molecular inhibitors, which are selective, which are reversible, and which are not toxic. And uh, as you can see from this picture, while well, the first step is the virtual screening. And on this way, of course, we search for the best candidates from compound libraries using molecular docking with the crystal structure of the peptidases. And then this, the best candidates, the best hints are then um, screened for binding and inhibition by enzyme kinetics, different binding methods, then imaging methods and so on. And then we follow the procedure with the in vitro uh, functional assays and in vivo functional assays. And the result of course is, uh, just how to go on now, I have some problems. Okay. I hope everything is fine. The result is the new inhibitor or the inhibitor combination. And here I would like to show you just one result. Using our platform, we identified nitroxoline, a small compound, which is the antibiotic used for urinary tract uh, infection treatment as a very potent inhibitor of cysteine peptidases, in particular catepsin B, which is very associated with the cancer progression. And we use this nitroxylin also as a lead compound while then synthesizing different derivatives. And we found this, uh, this uh, nitroxylin as a very potent to impair the tumor invasion in vitro and also in vivo. And in vivo, of course, this compound uh, reduces very significantly tumor growth and metastasis. So that was one part of the story. Detroxylin is uh, a very good candidate for repurposing in tumor therapy. Uh, but the other part is that after prolonged treatment, uh, these tumors develop resistance, and this resistance is reflected in overexpression of related peptidase, catepsin X. And when we developed the new inhibitor also for the catepsin X, the combination was much more effective compared to the individual inhibitor. So, also after prolonged treatment, the growth, tumor growth, and the uh, metastasis process was uh, reduced. Just to finalize this, my talk, I have to say that this PIP can be applied also for other purposes in neurodegeneration, where the role of peptidases is also very significant and what is also very actual at the moment. The peptidases are involved in the entry and replication of coronaviruses also SARS-CoV-2. So uh, this results, this inhibitors can be, can be applied for this purpose. And these are the most recent results in this field are promising as well. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I'm on time. Uh, thank you, Janko. And I should apologize. I should have said you, of course, from the Faculty of Pharma Pharmacy as well as um, Orban is also from the same faculty. So the presentation is, your presentation is now open for questions. Uh, are there questions from the audience or comments? So we have a question uh, from Ishtok Prislan to, can you please comment on, oh, questions gone. 
it's still on. So the question is, can you please comment yeah. the specific, uh, spec specificity of small molecule, molecules compared to bigger molecules? Well, definitely we know the specificity of, for example, monoclonal antibodies or neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, which can be used as well for the treatment or for the impairing of the peptidases. It's higher, but with the, let's say, uh, fine selection of these small molecules, we can, we can get also the specific molecules well, for specific for the, for the particular peptidase. Uh, that means, well, maybe specific for, let's say, at least two or three orders of magnitude uh, regarding the, the, the key A. So, yes, it's possible to get to prepare specific inhibitors also if there are small molecules. Mo, um, I would thank for the, for the answers. Sorry to interrupt, but we have to go on sure. with the next. Okay, right. And uh, the Thank discussion is, is, is very good for the, for the list part. Absolutely. So let's move on. Uh, as you said, suggest the next speaker is Lucia Masic from the University of Ljubljana and the Faculty of Pharmacy. And uh, the, her presentation is entitled Novel Broad Spectrum Multi-Targeting Antibiotics with Limited Resistance. Thank you. Uh, hello to all of you. My name is Lucia Petrlin Masic, and I will present you the discovery of novel broad spectrum multi targeting antibiotics with limited resistance. The team of the invention is part of the medicinal chemistry department at the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Ljubljana. There is a critical need for new therapies and new antibiotics to treat deadly infections caused by so called escape pathogens, bacteria that are often resistant to clinically available antibiotics. And based on the few charitable trust report from this year, there are only 41 antibiotics in clinical uh, studies, phase one, two, and three, and only a handful of those antibiotics in clinical studies are able to treat really the problematic infec infections caused by so-called escape pathogens that are also on a priority list of World Health Organization. So antibiotics that inhibit multiple targeting bacteria offer really a promising strategy to reduce resistant development. And actually we rationally designed new uh, dual inhibitors of two enzymes in bacteria, DNA gerase B and topoisomerase 4 with excellent activities against gram positive and gram negative bacteria. For example, um, two our representative compounds in red, ULD1 and 2 inhibit all of the tested staphylococcal clinical isolates at a concentration of one microgram per mil. In comparison to the clinically available antibiotics, there is, um, on, there is a, a huge uh, fail to inhibit a large portion of such uh, clinical strains at this concentration. We also confirmed in vivo potency against staphylococcal clinical isolates. And this was just published recently in Plus Biology. So our inhibitors, UL inhibitors, represent a new chemical class. And in comparison to the competitor antibiotics like zoliflodacin and gipotidocin, have a different mode of action. So there are some competitive advantages of our compounds, like efficacy against the most problematic escape pathogens, like MRSA, Cyclobacter baumani, no cross-resistance to fluoroquinolones, uh, resistance is exceptionally rare, there is no in vitro uh, toxicity, and several of the studies were per performed together with zero companies like Eurofins, Neosome, and IHMA. Actually, we made a breakthrough in 2018 when we confirmed potency against escape pathogens, and uh, at that year we entered into the IMI project, Enable New Drugs for Bed Bugs. It, we optimized compounds in a hit to lead project. Uh, last year, we also presented the innovation on BioPhiladelphia, Acmit Amsterdam, and to some pharmaceutical companies. And actually, we also collaborate with Europe, uh, University of Ljubljana Knowledge Transfer Office, and we are also part of the University of Ljubljana Innovation Fund. And actually, we are looking for uh, partners or outlicensed uh, invention. So the team of the invention is presented here. Uh, the University of Ljubljana team is expert in early drug discovery, and uh, safety in early drug discovery, especially heat discovery, heat to lead and heat optimization. 
And we also collaborate with Biological Research Center from SEGAT and University of Helsinki um, in Finland. And they have complementary skills in um, antibiotic resistance and in new technologies, how to design compounds less prone to target bait resistance. So thank you. Uh, thank you. So the presentation is open for questions and comments from the audience. I don't see any alerts in the chat room. Currently, there are no questions in the chat room. Uh, I can confirm as well. Uh, and, and the question from uh, Professor Knies we will address at the end. So uh, just to, to, to make sure every question is, is kind of uh, sure. answered. Right. Um, so maybe, maybe I can just ask one quick one. Um, the, the project is targeting two different uh, enzymes, as I understand it. So yes. how, what is the relative balance of activity that you're trying to achieve in this? And this can, of course, be quite a tricky, uh, tricky process in terms of uh, mm -hmm. our drug discovery project with your trying yes. to balance this is basic important mechanistic question. activity. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is important questions. question. And actually, our inhibitors almost equipotently inhibit both targets in low nanomolar range. So enzyme inhibition is really excellent on both targets. And that's what's required. That's what you're aiming for, equal activity. Uh, yes. I mean, this is the advantage and this is, right. uh, of course, required. OK. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So shall we uh, move on to the next presentation, Peter? Yeah. According to schedule, we are kind of on the time. So oh. let's do it. Thank you. So the, the next speaker is, uh, well, we're actually going across the pond to Harvard, I think. Uh, so it's uh, Marinka Zitne, and uh, we have a sort of good change in topic as well, moving away from sort of traditional drug discovery towards machine learning for therapeutics. And that's the uh, title of Marinka's uh, presentation. She's from the University of Harvard at the Broad Institute in America. Hey, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you Mo for this introduction. Uh, can I at least ask speakers to um, give me permission to share my screen? Okay, great. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I will talk uh, briefly about our efforts in machine learning and artificial intelligence for therapeutics. Um, and uh, in particular, science have, uh, has always uh, crucially de depended on the existence of scientific instruments. And while in the past, those scientific instruments were primarily optimized uh, for um, discovery you know, based on physical devices, and those physical instruments have facilitated the discovery such as microscope, we now are in the era of modern data intensive sciences. And so we need a new kind of instruments and tool that will facilitate discoveries. So I envision that in many ways, those tools will be optimized for knowledge discovery from data. That is a fantastic vision to have, in particular in the context of therapeutics and drug development, but it's practically quite challenging to realize, at least at this point in time. And so one of the major challenges to real, to, that prevent us from realizing this vision practically is that in order to model the effects of drugs and to generate and, and use the power of machine learning and algorithms and computational methodology to accelerate and expedite drug discovery, we really need to have complex um, and, and comprehensive models models that can model the effect of drugs on diseases. And so an effect of drug on a disease is inherently a network phenomenon. What I mean by that is that the drug um, exerts its effect on the human body, not only by, directly, uh, by, uh, by influencing the targets to which I directly bind, but also the effects of drugs propagate to underlying biological networks in which the drugs work. Similarly, many diseases don't are not independent of each other, but they might share a number of uh, genes. And because of that, it's really important to be able to model these um, dependencies jointly. 
So today I will just highlight one of the most recent projects that my group at Harvard has been involved in, and that is part of several efforts um, in the US related to COVID-19 task force. So the traditional approach of iterative drug development, experimental testing and clinical validation and approval of new drugs is, is not really feasible, especially given the compre compressed time scales that we are currently um, seeing in the context of COVID. So more realistic strategy is to think about uh, drug repurposing and opportunities to be able to find new tricks for old drugs or for drugs that are in late stage of drug development or that are already in the market to identify what drugs or combinations of drugs those drugs might have a therapeutic effect on COVID-19. In that regard, uh, my, my group has been involved in an effort where, that started in uh, early March, where we put to use our recent machine learning toolboxes to really rapidly identify repurposing opportunities. And then between May, uh, between May, April and July, being able to identify and validate those predicted um, uh, uh, drugs fairly easily and quickly. And so that has been done in, in major collaborations with the FDA, as well as the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratories um, and in the US, where they have validated in the laboratory laboratory, um, more than 77 drugs that were predicted by our algorithms. And those drugs were validated in the context of mouse as well as human cells. And 77 drugs have shown strong effect on inhibiting viral growth. Interestingly, because these, uh, these drugs were driven and identified by algorithms that we are developing, that led to an order of magnitude higher hit rate um, among top ranked drugs than prior work. So using our algorithms, we were able to identify um, around, around we, uh, we had a success rate of identifying on, uh, around 10% of drugs that were really um, um, showed promising um, effect on the virus in contrast to prior work where that was only possible for um, around less than 1%. So to, uh, this is my final slide. And to summarize, we are excited about the opportunities uh, that artificial intelligence and machine learning offers for the field of therapeutics. And in that regard, we're developing AI ML pipelines that allow domain experts to interact with AI to and ask a variety of questions related to drugs, drug combinations, and safety and efficacy of drugs in order to expedite the development of safer and effective medicines in the future and have a number of collaborations with large pharma companies where this methods are being deployed and put to practice. And if you are more, if you're excited or interested in learning more about these questions and opportunities that new technologies offer for the field of therapeutics, um, feel free to join us, to join us at the drug symposium um, in, in a couple of uh, weeks. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Marinka. Very interesting presentation, application of uh, uh, innovative new technology and in terms of identifying potential new therapeutic options for uh, COVID-19, uh, a global issue at the moment. So are there um, questions from uh, the presentations now open for discussion and questions and comments? Well, the questions are, you know, the, the Zoom chat box is, is open and they are can free to post questions and comments, but currently there are no questions present. Yeah, so perhaps I can again use exercise my uh, the prerogative of the chair uh, or the moderator if you like and just ask uh, one quick question to, to Marinka. So when, when you say it's very interesting you were able to identify these 37 uh, drugs that showed strong effect. What does that mean strong effect? I mean so is this within the range of the concentrations or consistent with the mechanisms that they're known to operate through or is this outside the you know, or is there a different concentration range, for example, you know, so it's maybe a, perhaps a different pharmacodynamic activity. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. And the answer to this is, is yes, we, uh, the drugs that showed positive effect were tested over, over a broad range of concentrations. And for several of those, uh, the effect was only achieved when the um, um, concentration and dosages were out of the normal or expected concentrations that are used in currently approved drugs. And so that has led uh, really to follow up work where we are uh, working with collaborate, experimental collaborators on drug combinations um, that allow us to combine multiple uh, drugs to exert for uh, to compensate for certain uh, safety issues that are um, 
that we have seen in some of the drugs that have really killed the virus, but also have um, caused undesired effects in the host, yeah. meaning human cells. All right. Interesting. Thank you. So uh, I think we move on to the next speaker, if there are no questions. There is a question, actually. Oh, there is a question. So, I see one, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you read it? Yes, read it? I can. Uh, yeah. So there's a question. Have you included peptidase inhibitors in your uh, screening, uh, Marenko? Yes, so we, we have included them. Um, um, we have... Well, uh, the, so the answer is yes, and all the data, including the list of drugs that were experimentally verified, as well as the, um, the experimental readouts are publicly available. So going to our lab website, you'll we'll find a, a preprint with links to the data sets for those drugs. And we have a follow-up screen of around 7,000 drugs uh, from the FDA um, that includes um, um, a large um, the, or a, a very diverse class of drugs beyond um, uh, peptide inhibitors. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't think I there are any questions more. are popping up, but unfortunately we have to go on and uh, the second question will be addressed in the Q&A uh, section at the end of the presentations. Okay, so... Um, Next presentation uh, is um, uh, from, uh, let's see if I can get the pronunciation correct here. Uh, Zeliko Knez uh, from the University of Marabo, Professor Zeliko Knez, and his title of his presentation is High Pressure Technologies for Formulation of Pharmaceuticals. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, more for your presenting. Uh, just to share my uh, uh, presentation, uh, it is uh, something on drug discovery. Uh, so it is, uh, let's say, on uh, formulation of drugs with supercritical fluids. Uh, thank you for inviting me and we are working on micronization using soup and supercritical fluids. So these are mostly CO2 at higher pressure and higher temperature, so about 40, over 40 degrees centigrade. And we are using... Uh, it's so that we are using supercritical fluids, uh, as I told you. Supercritical fluids are uh, liquids and gases over the critical point. For CO2, it is uh, the pressure range over 70, uh, 70 bar, and uh, 73 bar, and temperature 31 degrees centigrade. So this means that we can process the pharmaceutical at relatively very low uh, temperature. It is so that we mix the substances here in this autoclave and then we spray to ambient pressure and temperature and we can get the composites or we can micronize the pure drugs uh, to increase their solubility or uh, this bioavailability. We have done a lot of research with this uh, nifedipine, phenylodipine, phenofibrate, and so on. Here below you have some references, but of course we have done also a lot of research for multinational companies which are under uh, di uh, disclosure agreements so that we cannot present the, the, the results. So I don't know why it doesn't work on, so we can... Ah. Next, uh, yeah, the next step is impregnation using supercritical fluids. So where we mix all the substances and we add the CO2 uh, or some other gases and we, uh, 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 we incorporate the drugs in uh, porous structures. We use aerogels or we use some other, uh, impregnant, uh, some other substances to impregnate them. And it is so that we have, uh, let's say, a successful drug delivery system developed uh, with impregnation of different uh, substrate. The next topic is uh, extraction of uh, bioactive compounds using soup and supercritical fluids. Here we don't use only CO2, but also some other gases. Uh, like uh, propane, uh, like some freons and so on. And a lot of research was published and done on HOP, on extraction of polyphenols and valuable compounds from Ganoderma. 
I should like to thank you for your attention and I'm available for any questions on or any possible cooperation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so the presentation is uh, now open for questions and comments. Do we have any in the chat? No, currently there are no questions regarding yeah. this presentation yeah. in the chat as well. So, um, shall we move on, Peter, then to the next, if there are no comments, perhaps the audience can keep the presentation in mind when we have the end panel discussion at the end, we can come back to this presentation. Okay, so yeah. the next speaker is, as I have it on my agenda, is uh, Thomas Langerholk, is that correct? Yes. And, correct. Uh, uh, you're the Associate Professor from the University of Marlborough. <laughs> and yeah, please go ahead, because I don't seem to have the title for your presentation at hand. My apologies for that, yeah. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So in our research group, uh, we mainly focus on functional foods and uh, food safety issues. We also closely collaborate with European Food Safety Authority on, on many other uh, issues that are related to food. And uh, our research is mainly based on, on uh, food metrics and uh, how we can use it to create healthy foods. So if you look at the, if you look at the absorption, uh, sorry, if you look at the uh, food in general, food is a complex mixture uh, made of uh, proteins, uh, carbohydrates, fats, and other, uh, and other, other uh, bioactive molecules, uh, which are especially found in, uh, in plant matrix. And uh, by using different compounds that are found in food and, we, and that we put them into another food, we can actually um, influence absorption of some specific molecules that we want to target. Um, we can target uh, contaminants. This is what we have done mostly so far. And uh, let's say there is, we worked a lot on mercury and mercury, we all know that it's a common problem, a common problem that we face by uh, consumption of seafoods. And by using some specific polyphenols, we can, uh, we can, um, achieve almost total eradication uh, of, um, of mercury so that it cannot be absorbed. We also worked with some other biological contaminants uh, like, uh, like uh, Campylobacter. And uh, in the same way, we managed to achieve uh, a very nice reduction of, of uh, Campylobacter potential to invade, to infect and to invade intestinal epithelial cells. So the same approach can be also used with other health compounds that we want to increase absorption. Um, and uh, we can use this data uh, to, do, uh, to perform better risk assessment of specific contaminants that we can find in food. We can also prevent, uh, prevent the disease uh, uh, due to chemical and biological contaminant exposure. And, and uh, in terms of industry, we can also use it to, to generate functional foods. So uh, using uh, smart design of various food metrics components, it's not about finding a cure for the disease. This is unlike uh, uh, other presentations that we, that we have heard so far, but it's more about the prevention of the disease. So how to study we can study it in uh, various ways. So on the left side, there is, a, there is a, I would say, the most easiest way how you can study it. So what you do, you perform in vitro digestion, a simulation of digestion of various foods, and um, you simulate digestion in the mouth, in the stomach, in the intestine. Uh, and by using this uh, digestion, we can also further use these fractions to check for the absorption in the intestine, um, especially this part uh, to simulate the absorption can be done in many ways. Uh, mainly it's used by uh, measuring absorption of 
compounds of interest through intestinal layers of cells, but these uh, layers can be made quite simple or you can complicate them a lot with other cell types in between and other um, molecules that, that can affect the absorption. So what we are uh, designing now is the, we are trying to design a database uh, that is, uh, that we will try to measure uh, the influence of priority contaminants and healthy compounds. So a database that will first collect all the information that is scattered all around the literature. Plus we want to add our own, we want to add our own uh, research to fill the gaps that are still left. And um, there's quite a lot of information about these issues and uh, we want to use machine learning to, um, to uh, speed the process. And the final aims that we want to do, uh, to, to want to achieve is, uh, first of all, safe, safe food for everyone. Uh, we want to improve public safety. We want to uh, generate advice to consumers on how to combine various foods that, that, that we have on the market. And uh, also there is for the industry, there, of course, there, there are some opportunities, especially by targeted development of ingredients that we can put into foods that we are know that they are risky. And by doing that, again, we can increase the sales or also we can persuade consumers that the food that we are offering is safe. So uh, for the end, maybe, yes, prevention is better than the cure. Uh, we all know that food is like a, um, is like a way on the, is like a long, is like a long run, the way you eat now, the way, uh, this means the way how healthy you will be uh, when you're old. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the presentation is open for discussion now. I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, group. So from Eastock Prislan, is this database going to be publicly available and are there on potential for online application perhaps? Yes, that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to find, to organize the data in a way that it will be made, uh, first of all, available online. And uh, we are also trying different ways how to organize this data so it will be user-friendly to find the information that you need. Thank you. Currently, there are no questions, so I, I suggest that we move on. If you, yeah, we move on to the next speaker, and and that is uh, uh, Professor Moch Lunder uh, from the, who's the chair of pharmaceutical uh, uh, biology at the University of Ljubljana and the Faculty of Pharmacy. And the title of the presentation is Peptide-Based Immunotherapy for Life-Threatening Peanut Allergy. Okay, so uh, thank you for this introduction. Uh, I am trying to share my screen. Um, let me see if... Um, Am I being successful? Yes. 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 Okay. Everything is okay. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the invitation to this event. Um, the results and activities presented here are a product of cooperation between our chair, the Chair of Pharmaceutical Biology, Faculty of Pharmacy and University Clinic Gonik. Within uh, our cooperation, we have been developing and testing hypoallergenic constructs for use in specific immunotherapy of allergies. Our hypoallergenic constructs are based on peptides and these peptides mimic allergen epitopes. So such peptides are obtained by screening uh, phage libraries against a selected target. Uh, in the presented work, we confronted the problem of peanut allergy. This is a serious condition. Uh, it affects mostly children, uh, namely 2% of children in the UK, the USA and Canada. The allergic reaction is severe and can lead to life-threatening anaphylaxis. 
compared to some other allergies, here immunotherapy is far from established, so solutions are urgently needed. We have pursued two strategies. Uh, first, for improved, uh, safer immunotherapy, we aimed to produce immunogenic, protective, and non reactogenic vaccine candidate uh, for immunotherapy that is based on peptides. For this purpose, we have uh, identified EGE-like uh, uh, peptides, so the mimetics of EGE epitopes, uh, and display them on a different, uh, different um, types of carriers. So we used Lactococcus lactis or its surface uh, proteins, and we used phage coat proteins. Um, the second strategy emerged uh, during different tests for evaluation of uh, immunotherapeutic potential of our peptides and hypoallergenic construct. Uh, we discovered some unexpected properties of our peptides and uh, uh, came up with a completely new concept for prevention of allergic reaction. So we noticed that our peptides bind to specific EGEs on the surface of effector cells that are derived uh, from allergic patients, and that they prevent effector cell activation. So they prevent uh, basophil and mast cell degranulation and uh, consequently a histamine release that is typical for allergic reactions. Um, so then we get uh, different ideas uh, about the use of such peptides. Uh, they could protect patients uh, during contact with allergen, either in accidental exposures or intentional exposures during specific immunotherapy. For example, they could be used to supplement emergency kits uh, for self-management of anaphylaxis, or maybe even uh, substitute omalizumab, uh, which is a, a monoclonal antibody that is being tested for prevention of anaphylaxis during immunotherapy. Uh, our current activities uh, are now focused into further evaluation of these epitope-like peptides. We are establishing also their effect on mast cell degranulation. Uh, we are planning to optimize them for um, uh, for in vivo experiments, we will prepare conjugates and prodrags to enhance delivery and membrane penetrating properties. Uh, and we are also planning in vivo tests on mouse model of food allergy, and that will be in collaboration. Um, we have uh, filed a PCT application and uh, for for these uh, peptides, and we are looking for options and opportunities, collaborations to further develop this uh, towards the product. Um, and of course, this is in line with the growth of global immunotherapy mar market and other global initiatives. Um, so with this, I will conclude and um, give the word to the moderator. Thank you. Ah, thank you. So the presentation is open for uh, questions and comments from the audience. Just trying to see. I don't think there is anything. Okay. Yeah, there is a question here from um, Eastock Prislan. Please comment on what course of action is more prudent: allergen removal or immunotherapy? Uh, well, allergen removal or avoiding uh, to allergen is, it's not really a step towards um, a solution. So being able to live normally in the world that is full of allergens. Uh, so immunotherapy is a very good approach and it's working very well for some allergens, but unfortunately for peanut allergen, there is a, a huge lack of um, different hypoallergenic constructs that could be safer uh, in the process of immunotherapy. 
Okay. Thank you very much. If there are no further comments or questions, I don't see any more. I think we can move on to the next and the last speaker, uh, who is uh, Samu Gujales, a researcher at the University of Ljubljana, again from the Faculty of Pharmacy. And the title of the presentation is Conjugated Pattern Recognition Receptor Agonists as Vaccine Adjuvants and Immunotherapeutics. Thank you, Mo, for the introduction. So our immune system represents the cornerstone of protection against invading pathogens and internal dangers such as cancerous cells. While it's more than capable of handling the vast majority of threats, it can also be engineered for therapeutic purposes. This led to the conception of vaccines more than 200 years ago, which is now one of the most effective interventions of modern medicine. Uh, okay, let me just go, okay. So most modern vaccines consist of recombinant antigens, which by themselves can't provoke the required immune response. So to stimulate the immune system, we also need additional pathogen-associated danger signals. These come in the form of vaccine adjuvants, which are either compounds or formulations that our immune system detects as foreign or dangerous and then responds to them accordingly. Due to their essential role in vaccines, they're often called immunologists' dirty little secrets. Uh, despite their importance in vaccines, the choice of registered adjuvants is currently still lacking. So to expand the library of available adjuvants, our group focused on the development of compounds targeting pattern recognition receptors. True to their name, uh, these receptors recognize and respond to molecular patterns associated with invading pathogens. Uh, the two receptors that we are mostly focusing on are the NOT2 and TLR7. Both are parts of our innate immune system where the first one detects fragments of the bacterial cell wall, while the second one detects viral RNA. Uh, while stimulating one or the other by itself produces an immune response, stimulating both at once produces a synergistic effect that is stronger than the sum of responses to individual agonists. Uh, by developing synthetic analogs of natural compounds that these receptors detect, and then linking them together with various linking molecules, we developed conjugated dual NOT2 TLR7 agonists. Um, we are currently in the preclinical stage of development where the results of various in vitro assays revealed the remarkable immunostimulatory potential of these conjugates. Uh, in light of this, they could also be used in immunotherapy. And while the examples are numerous, uh, the most prominent one would be cancer immunotherapy where similarly to vaccination, we can direct our immune system to target and eliminate abnormal cancer cells. Uh, compared to the traditional approaches of chemotherapy and irradiation, this alternative avoids the severe and often intolerable side effects. Uh, as one of the examples of the efficacy of our compounds, in an assay where we combined human immune cells with various cancer cell lines, our compounds tripled the capacity of um, immune cells to target and destroy cancer cells. Uh, additional testing, including animal in vivo testing, is currently underway in collaboration with various partners, while at the same time we recently protected our compounds with a patent application. Uh, so to conclude, vaccines and immunotherapy have and will continue to save countless lives, and I believe that our and similar compounds could eventually be at the forefront of this process. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, the presentation is now open for a uh, discussion. Uh, let's see, there's um, I think one in possibly. Currently, there is no question posted yeah, in the chat box. So if you have some. Yeah. It's a very interesting presentation. So, I mean, obviously very topical as well, just now with the focus on uh, the development of a treatment for COVID-19 and, um, and and the role that adjuvants might play, you know, towards that uh, discovery of that treatment as well. So you have the vaccines and perhaps in the future, you know, uh, there may be some combination with vaccine, adjuvants to try and potentiate the effects of vaccine and limit the side effect. But do the adjuvants themselves have some concerns with regards to safety and how will that be investigated in your, in your project plan? Well, so 
there's always the problem of overactivation of the immune system, which could lead to um, intense immune reactions, shocks. Um, so that's why we're trying with in vivo testing. So besides the actual efficiency of the compounds, we're also uh, checking. So we're, the current experiments that we're doing are in mice. Then besides measuring the antibody responses, we also check the weight and similar um, markers that could be used as um, indicators of whether the compounds actually produce any severe side effects. OK, good, thank you. All right, so I think that's the end of the uh, uh, session involving presentations. And we have now, I think, we are now entering the, the discussion, general round of discussion. But Peter, I suggest perhaps look if there are any outstanding questions in the chat. For, uh, well, there was one, I would say, question, uh, rather in interesting, but uh, Maybe from Professor Knees to, I think, Professor Kos regarding how far is the registration, and maybe this is the, the, the start of the new debate. Okay. If I may just, maybe we can ask everybody to turn their camera on, and yeah. they can also just, you know, ask the question live and just unmute themselves. So we yeah. see everybody, okay? okay? It will be more like, you know, in a real world. And try and get close as possible, at least, <laughs> to the real world. <laughs> if may I uh, reply to this uh, question, how far is the registration? I would say quite far for, for this the nitroxylin uh, case. Uh, of course, we, we've mm, filed a patent uh, application and we are looking for for the partners um, so this is this is uh, for the let's say to repurpose the application of the nitroxylin for the cancer treatment but there are possibilities for other repurposes as well so we are we are working on on this yeah and definitely we are looking for partners you know to to collaborate and uh, we did some activities already on this. Thank you and I wish you a lot of success. Thank you. Uh, and I see a question from um, Anna Mitrovov. Did you focus on virus or host peptidases? And I'm trying to... Was the question for uh, Professor Marinka Zitnik. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Um, um, so that, that's a great question. And uh, we, we focused on um, uh, host, uh, um, uh, on host uh, proteins targeted by the virus. So the idea was uh, to, um, to construct uh, the SARS-CoV-2 interactum. Um, and uh, the way we were able to do that is in collaboration with uh, several groups from University of California at San Francisco uh, that they were, where they have mapped uh, viral host interactions uh, for uh, the virus. And that allowed us to uh, identify a set of host proteins attacked by the virus. And uh, that was the one of the primary sources of the data that was used to then prioritize um, drugs against that um, set of actually graph structured uh, SARS-CoV-2 disease modules um, and that allowed us to generate predictions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, are there any other questions that I may have missed in the uh, group chat? No, in the chat it's, it's quite, uh, uh, that's that what it was. Okay, so how, how much time do have you have left now for this session? Is it um, 15, 20 minutes or so? Yeah, roughly 15 minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes, yeah. So, yeah, and I'll just take the opportunity to thank all the speakers again. I, I think that the talks were varied and uh, in, in terms of topic and uh, also very interesting in terms of the science and the technology that's being developed and some projects a little bit more mature from a drug, uh, drug discovery perspective than others. 
So thank you for your effort and sharing your ideas and your science and your research. Uh, I think uh, it was quite an interesting display of uh, innovation that's going on within Slovenia at the University of Ljubljana and, and Maribor. So in the remaining time that we have, um, and of course, as I think Peter mentioned in his kind introduction to myself, that I am an industry uh, uh, drug discovery scientist, uh, pharmacologist by training, but uh, really a drug discovery expert and specialist uh, working as an independent consultant just now. So I'm available if there are particular questions that you would like from an industrial perspective, uh, we can uh, do that. Uh, if you would like some more input with regards to your own project or anything else, but or if there are particular topics that you would like to sort of discuss within the context of this session, the drug discovery session, and, and that uh, we can spend meaningfully spend our time in, in discussing over the next 15 minutes or so. I mean, I have a couple of ideas in mind, but I think it'd be more interactive and better that if you've got some thoughts and then we can have a free flowing discussion around that. So is there anything in topic in particular based on the presentations today or project either from the presenters or other members of the audience that you think we can uh, uh, have a interactive discussion around just now. So. Um, uh, perhaps you can express your opinion on the group chat um, or it could be anything else that's come up say in the uh, the panel session earlier on prior to this session as well there was very interesting discussion about how um, industries reaching out to the external innovation space that includes the academic institutions and researchers so that's uh, that's another possibility I invite all the uh, attendees to kind of uh, open the mics and, and, and ask the questions if there are any. Let me start maybe Mo, just to, to break the ice. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think this, you know, that you coming from the industry is interesting and um, maybe it would be good if you can give us the interest industry perspective in what is really uh, a key factor what what is for you the uh, means that something is innovative right what are what is the industry actually looking for right yeah i think that's a really pertinent question because um, innovation might have lots of different shades around it you know it could potentially be viewed as 50 shades of gray if you like and and there are different tiers of innovation and different levels of innovation. So what you hear about sometimes is, um, you know, incremental innovation. So this is an improvement on pre-existing ideas and technologies, or you have breakthrough innovation, right? So the trend nowadays in industry, at least based on my experience, is shifted towards breakthrough innovation. In one of the presentations, we touched upon the question about, I think it was Urban's presentation, whether the idea for the, the, the compounds that they're developing, the project for canine cognitive dysfunction, are, um, a limitation might be that they're not disease modifying, so they don't affect the progression of the illness, but help to alleviate some of the symptoms, behavioral disturbances, and may help to alleviate some of the behavioral disturbances in, in, in dogs suffering from that illness. Um, so, you know, and of course, the, the industry focus now is very much towards actually high impact innovation. So drug targets that are highly novel and, um, and that partly is related to the fact that um, some points that were actually addressed during the panel discussion in terms of what, what is involved in drug discovery and development. It's a very lengthy process. It's a very costly process. And, uh, and it's a very risky process. So in order to, to manage that risk in terms of getting return on investment, which the industry is, a, you know, it's, it's a business environment. So you have to look at that. Uh, the, the, the selection of the, the, the drug target in the, in the first place is a very important decision point, right? And um, so if you select something that is already known out there, a mechanism or a target that's already been explored, right? Then you have to have a much, very compelling argument to, to, uh, to say that that is still a commercially viable approach to follow. Given the length of time it will take, it will take 10, 15 years to get 
a new product out onto the market. And so that's why the industry is really focused on highly innovative drug targets and approaches and breakthrough innovation, that's what it's called. And then you might have sort of incremental innovation where there is room for improvement. And if it's nowadays more about controlling side effects or um, minor, if you like, uh, improvements, then the commercial case tends to be really not particularly attractive or viable. So if you're involved in research where you're looking at targets that are already known, drug targets or enzymes or mechanisms that have already been explored, it's not to say you don't do that research. It's really just to say if you're interested in applying that research towards a commercial direction, then to think carefully about, well, what would be the differentiation? What would be the added value coming from that project? And the industry tends to be a little bit more critical about those particular, that type of innovation. But that's not to say that innovation isn't important. I think from a basic research point of view, it's, it's valuable. And then you have some form of innovation and creativity, which is not amenable to translation to application. So, you know, it's generating basic knowledge or understanding about uh, uh, nature itself. So, and that's valuable and it's important. But uh, so I think it's important to keep a uh, perspective that not all innovation can be translated to application and, and that's okay as well. But generally speaking now industry is looking and focused towards you know uh, highly innovative approaches and strong differentiation from the state of art. Yeah. So I guess this is this is the same as you know also the speakers in the panels have already said right first that target is the key right um, and then also, would you agree with what uh, I think Ralph said, um, having a board that actually also kills the project that are not so innovative, uh, probably that is also important, right? Not to absolutely. Perceive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, having been in industry for more than 30 years, I remember when I first started in industry, there was, there was I think Ralph used the word stigma. So there was a little bit of stigma. I mean, nobody wants to fail. Nobody likes the word failure. There's somebody in America who doesn't like the word loser or failure. <laughs> but, you know, um, I, I think from an industry perspective, there's been a, a culture change, which is to think about, well, failure. And I think in the, in, in, it varies also across Europe compared to America. There's a sort of different culture in how we deal with failure. And, and, uh, and, and failure is not necessarily a sign or a, a weakness. It's, it's an opportunity to learn to go on and then you know, try again and be successful. And within a drug discovery context, stopping a project as early as possible is very important now. So of course, if, if you've spent a few years working on a project, it's not that easy, it's not an easy decision. It requires a little bit of courage and it requires uh, you know, discipline as well. So the way industries dealt with that now actually is that, um, to encourage people to think about this is and, and get the mindset uh, change, if you like, on this topic is that people are recognized for recommending when they think uh, a project should be stopped early. So this idea of a killer experiment is actually quite critical. It's common terminology in the industry to try and get to that critical decision-making uh, experiment which and data that will allow you to make a decision either to go on with the project or to stop it. Because the earlier you can stop a project, uh, the sooner that you can then divert those resources to something else, right? You're not continuing to spend resources, time and effort on pursuing something that may not be uh, viable in the long run. Uh, so this idea of a killer experiment is very important and to think about that as well. And, uh, and my experience is that in having worked with uh, a variety of sort of many academic, uh, really top class academic researchers across the world in the US and Europe is that, and it's understandable that if you've invested a fair bit of your life and time working on projects that you're passionate about for 10, 20 years, the idea of killing something is not, you know, it's not that easy to deal with. But within a sort of commercial, if it's a, an exercise in commercialization and application towards commercialization, then I think you have, the, have to develop that mindset and think, oh, yet at a certain point, we might have to make that dif difficult decision. Yeah. Any comments on that? Yeah. There's a, do we still have an audience? <laughs> Uh, 
You know, I was asking my, myself, where is the, you know, where is the line? Uh, you know, wh when to decide uh, which uh, project should, uh, you know, and when to decide, maybe from our perspective. Because you know the audience is also researchers, and, and as you said, you know they're working like ten years on the project, and then at the end you have to abandon it. You know something at least has to come out of it, right? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, well, I mean something does come out of it, which is knowledge and learning, right? Even if you have to stop something, the worst kind of failure, if you like, is where you don't learn anything. I would say, right? If you learn something. It means you, if you try again, then you can try and do things differently. You learn from that experience. We all like to learn, you know, even if it's poor experiences in life, we learn. And um, so, but I, I completely understand the dynamic in terms of being in an academic environment where you've invested, you know, a, a lot of energy and time and passion in working up and research. And this is why I think the other points that came up in the panel discussion was about training you know, to prepare people who are in the academic environment to think like entrepreneurs or what it's like to be working in industry or in a commercial project. I think it requires a little bit of a different mindset. But of course, you don't need to become an expert in that. You can, you can, you know, you can build your team that you have people with that knowledge and experience coming in. Not everybody needs to be, you know, um, excellent and, uh, you know, highly competent at every skill set. So you need to get that within the team. And bringing in external experts can be one way of doing that, or training your, you know, PhDs or graduate students in that uh, respect is can also be helpful, which I think was mentioned as well. Um, so it's it's um, it's a, it's a tough call, but I think you know commercialization projects all involve tough decisions at some point or another. So you have to be prepared to let go, but it's not the end of the story in terms of a, a, an academic research group. Because um, because they they're always looking at how new ways to extend and develop the research. So if one avenue closes, perhaps some another one can open. You know, you learn from it. But the key thing is to learn from uh, these experiences, really. Okay. Yeah, I agree. In, yeah. So, but maybe you know we kind of, uh, went to 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 side with with the debate maybe for for a second but i would also invite maybe the, the panelists and and the participant participants maybe to comment yeah sure. please I think, that, I think that's a good idea let's get the speakers on and uh we'll give the the presentations and see uh yep. hear their opinion okay so um but maybe before the, uh, the comment this um uh, discussion. So I also wanted to ask uh, Marinka Zitnik if she's still with us a little bit more about uh, artificial intelligence. So you mentioned our, it was possible to read uh, your um, activities in um, predictions of safety and now today we heard about drug repurposing and about interaction patterns and so on. But um, what is uh, what will be your further plan? So uh, will you also use the technology to design new compounds? Or for example, maybe in antibacterial field, there is a huge lack of understanding of resistant processes or efflux mechanisms. So I would like to ask you about maybe also how to, because uh, I think that also this year uh, we saw one, um, uh, one publication about the discovery of new antibacterial compounds with artificial intelligence. But based on my opinion, the compounds that came out, the properties then can be the problem. So can you comment about your future plans? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Lucia, for this question. Uh, that's a wonderful question. I, I guess you're referring to the recent cell publication by Rekina Barzilai and Jim Collins, which are actually a, a very close collaborators of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in, indeed, I think there are great opportunities here for um, using um, um, AI and ML methods in particular to 
prioritize experiments or to identify promising hypotheses that then can be uh, followed uh, upon in downstream validation experiments. So in the paper that you were mentioning, one of the endpoints that um, the researchers were interested in were, were, was that of bacterial resistance modeling. And um, the methods used there were to were so-called generative algorithms that allowed us to um, syn 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 synthetically synthesize um, first using AI algorithms and then um, um, in, in the lab, uh, certain uh, molecules and compounds. And there are a number of challenges when doing so. One of them is certainly that we want to uh, use the algorithms in such a way that will synthesize molecules that have desired properties. The other question is really the question of diversity of the molecules that are generated by the AI algorithms, since um, we found that in many cases, these algorithms generate valid molecules, but not necessarily interesting, interesting molecules from the pharma standpoint. So sort of like while they are technically correct and, and, and valid and plausible, they either don't have uh, the properties that one would want them to have in order to follow up uh, in, in kind of in experiments. And so what that means is that certainly that uh, creates some questions regarding the availability of large data sets that uh, are often needed to train these algorithms to, to set their parameters in such a way that they generate and prioritize, identify hy hypotheses that are um, useful and I often use the term actionable in the sense that not only generate kind of nice results that can be put in a paper, but that one can really act upon them. And that often means we need to optimize not only for the C, for the sh for just some measure of accuracy or performance, which we like to do in the field of machine learning, but really how actionable is a prediction in the sense that does it give to domain experts in many of our projects, those are biologists or, or clinical researchers, does it give them a direct hypothesis that they can um, validate in the lab? And so that then means we have to ask, have models for a number of questions uh, along the drug discovery pipeline. And like several questions were mentioned today regarding the identification of drug targets, or even before that, uh, identification of promising compounds after among among tens of millions of compounds, for example, from PubChem. What are those we, that are promising in the sense that have certain properties that we would want them to have? Then identifying um, the drug targets uh, and, and then predicting safety, efficacy, and down the line resistance of some of these drugs is certainly of great interest. Um, our group has a few collaborations in the space of um, drug resistance um, in the context of bacterial infections, infections, but also the Broad Institute um, in relationship to cancer, where we're looking at um, cancer dependency maps and mutations that uh, confer um, um, cancer cell um, essentiality phenotypes in order to identify um, actually novel therapeutic targets um, mm -hmm. for for cancer, um, and it's it's. It's a major effort at, uh, as well at NIH as well to, to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yeah, could, if I could just uh, add a little bit to that uh, very interesting uh, 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 answer there. Um, I was just wondering, so, I mean, if the molecule, the question was if the molecule is not optimal in terms of progressing as a, as a, as a kind of drug candidate, if you like. So, you no, know, I think your objective was to focus on the, identifying an opportunity for repurposing, right? But I guess it's still interesting and useful information if you identify something that shows activity but may not be progressible in turn from a drug discovery perspective, that a particular mechanism has been identified and you have a hit compound, right, which may be a known drug, but then that can be a starting point to actually identify and develop more promising molecules as well, you know. So starting de novo uh, drug discovery program. Oh yes, absolutely. So in um, th there are actually quite a bit of discussion regarding the utility and usefulness of drug repurposing in, as mm -hmm. you might know, in, in, yeah. in the pharmaceutical space and um, in the context of 
the current pandemic that of course certainly seemed a very viable approach that also has improved uh, this current state of therapeutics for COVID and substantially decreased, for example, the, the death, um, the threat rate, at least in the US because of the availability of remdesivir and some other therapeutics. Um, and so in that regard, it certainly makes sense to uh, leverage drug repurposing as one technology to be able to rapidly respond to the ongoing health crisis. Um, in the, de the design of novel drugs, I think there are, there's lots of questions here that go beyond pure science. Um, in, in, in the context of like big pharma companies that my group is working with, certainly there is a good question whether, yes, we might find that certain drug is, that exists on the market or was in the late stages of clinical trials, but it failed for the initial primary disease. And the question is, well, why, why did that uh, drug in the late final stages of clinical development, why did it fail? And so we try to understand that by modeling the data and try to see where did it fail because of the on-target toxicity. In, in that case, that's the end of the story, right? right. Because uh, that cannot really, it, it's very hard to go to, to do anything about it. But if there was the drug that did not fail because of on target toxicity, then it's a good question whether, well, can we repurpose it for some other indication or other disease? And then it depends what is the pharma company that you work with, because each of them, it's just the large companies, have they, they have their own disease areas of interest, okay. meaning the area and the diseases for that they are interested. Uh, to develop drugs for. And, and so there is there are all these questions that go then beyond uh, just um, kind of sci scientific findings and discoveries. But I absolutely agree that in several drug repurposing projects that we did for COVID and before then for schizophrenia, and we now have a project for ALS where we're looking at ultra high order combinations of up to 10 drugs. Um, there, is, there, there are exciting findings. And as you said before, uh, this uh, new knowledge and mechanisms that we are able to pinpoint and discover by, uh, by, by kind of looking at what is currently known about drugs on the market identifying off targets effects. Uh, it's known that just like 20 to 30% of those direct targets are known. So uh, being able to uh, predict those off targets effects is extremely useful. And that has given us a several, um, a lot has allowed us to make a couple of quite good strides on identifying novel treatments for uh, schizophrenia and ALS uh, that we are now validating in uh, real patients, um, as well as some, as well as some of them in still in human uh, cell lines. Right. Fantastic! Sounds very fascinating and fabulous. So it's more than just uh, COVID nineteen. You're you're applying your Absolutely. technology in lots of different directions. Okay, great, excellent. So Peter, I, I, how are we doing in terms of time? I think we're kind of almost toward, at the end of the session now. Or yeah. Yeah, you know, regarding the time, we are at the end, but, you know, I urge participants and, and panelists to kind of, you know, because this is the last minute. Yeah, so, but but it's not. If if the debate is, is going, maybe one question or two, if there is, otherwise, we will kind of... Uh, we will wrap up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think uh, hopefully the, the audience has uh, um, gain some insight in terms of uh, what's involved in drug discovery from the very interesting presentations we've had today and also from the discussion as well. I'd just like to take the opportunity again. I guess we can bring the session to a close now, Peter, right? Uh, given I, I don't see any questions in the, the group chat, any further comments or questions. So just take the opportunity to thank the speakers for making the time and the effort to and share their uh, really very interesting presentations and, and, and research with us. and. Uh, and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors and your project. So let's stay connected and continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Both for for the presentation, and uh, I thank all the participants. And I invite you actually for uh, further um, uh, events and. Uh, uh, sessions. We will keep uh, the debate alive in also in Ruhua mobile app and uh, web app. And uh, you know, you can there meet attendees and organizers and talk to them and uh, uh, all, all the scientists. 
And you can also check the links in the uh, Zoom chat box, which will guide you on how to use and uh, download mobile app. And also for the uh, rating this session. Uh, so in the next sessions, in the next days, there are plenty more to come. Uh, you can also check this on agenda, agenda, and uh, which is also in the Zoom uh, chat box. I invite you also to join us at the next event Smart Future on the 17th of October, and also you can tune in into live a stream of Rector's Award Ceremony for the Best Innovation of the University of Ljubljana, and also for the bonus workshops that our researchers are offering as part of the Unimines Festival. Yeah, so with this kind of, we uh, wrap it up this session and we see you in the next one uh, with the Re Researchers Days of, of Novartis. So thank you for joining us and uh, uh, see you in the next session.